Well, welcome to the final session of day two of Rio 2023. I'm delighted to welcome back the same panel from the previous session, Dr. Raul Doshi, Fu Song, and Dr. Vivek Reddy. This is a presentation and discussion session. Um, so our topic is actionable, explainable, and biologically plausible AI-enhanced ECG models. And our presenter is uh, Dr. Fu Song. Over to you. Uh, you're muted, Fusong. Oh. Okay. There you go. You're good now. Oh, thank you. So thanks for the introduction. And we're going to take a bit of a change in direction now. I've seen some really cool talks and nice technologies today uh, in, in Rio, but we're going to move back to the very humble ECG. And as an electrophysiologist, I've rediscovered a new passion for the ECG in the last couple of years or so. And I'm going to tell you why in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So the ECG was first recorded about 150 years ago in our hospital here in London. And we've been using it for all kinds of reasons for diagnosis and prognosis. And we're it's part of our lives. We have a way of looking at ECGs. I teach my fellows that we look at the P wave for the atrial depolarization, the QRS for ventricular depolarization, and the T wave for ventricular repol. And the systems really helped us to think about the ECG, but equally has been extremely unhelpful in being a straitjacket, stopping us to look at the ECG in new and creative ways. Now, with AI, this has really freed us up to look at ECG in multiple new ways that we've never really previously uh, been aware of. If you ask ChatGPT what is AI, it will tell you that AI is the simulation of human intelligence in machines that program to think and act like humans. And if you apply an AI algorithm to the ECG, it is not trapped by our conventional way of viewing the ECG as the P wave, QRS, and T wave. The model instead has the freedom to look at it in all the constituent parts and combine them in linear ways to make diagnoses and so to make prognoses and also risk stratification. So how does this work? How do we train an AI model to look at ECGs to help us make diagnoses and to risk stratify uh, our patients? There's a difference between machine learning versus traditional programming. In traditional programming, we program the rules. So we tell the program our own rules, like measure the QRS. Is it broad? Is it narrow? Is it high risk or low risk? And the program looks at it and comes up with the answers. With machine learning, this flips the paradigm on its head. Instead, we feed lots of data with answers, and the machine learns new rules to associate the data to the answer. So new rules that we as humans were previously potentially unaware of. So I'm going to share some work that we've been doing with using AI ECG to derive phenol groups, to look at different risk profiles that have a different biological meaning. So we hypothesize that if you show a neural network millions of ECGs, it will over time learn multiple features, subtle features of ECG that have clear clinical and biological relevance that can help us as EPs and as clinicians. So to do this, we took 1.6 million ECGs from Brazil, and we use an existing model that's out there that takes the ECG and allows us to classify into six diagnoses. So AF, bradycardia, tachycardia, first degree AV block, left and right bundle branch block. But instead of using the outputs of the model, we went into the black box of the model and extracted the 5,000 features that the model has learned over many, many rounds of looking at millions and millions of ECGs. And we asked whether or not these features that the model has learned are biologically important and meaningful, and can they guide us in how we treat our patients? So we used these 5,000 features to cluster our patients into different groups. And we found that there were three main phenol groups based on the presence or absence of these features. And what we found was that they had very different survival trajectories. So in an unsupervised way, the machine and the model has learned important subtle features that differentiate high versus low risk individuals without the human telling it what the high and low risk features are. Importantly, even if you take ECGs that were labeled as normal by physicians, so there's an EP or cardiologist saying this is a normal ECG, the model is still able to pick out high risk features in what supposedly appears to be a normal ECG. 
We then wanted to test this externally. You have a risk of overtraining a model to your own derivation set. So we wanted to make sure that the model holds to external transnational cohorts. And we looked at five other cohorts from Brazil, the UK, and the US, ranging from volunteers to primary and secondary care patients through to Chagas cardiomyopathic patients in Brazil. And what we found was this model that we had clearly externally validated well in, in all of these cohorts across multiple different countries and different types of patients, the neural network derived features are able to identify groups of patients with worse mortality profiles over many, many years, over five to 20 years as shown here on these kaplan meyer survival curves. The biggest question is why. I think one of the problems with AI is explainability. And we've been shown some of the amazing capability of AI models, but physicians remain slightly skeptical on the one hand because they're not explainable, but also equally, if they don't tell you what's wrong with the patient, they're not very actionable. So we wanted to explore what these model predictions meant when what they were really looking at, firstly using the UK Biobank. And this is a rich resource of half a million patients or individuals in the UK. That's a publicly available research database. And we looked at trying to explain what our model was really looking at when it predicts a high-risk individual. This is an analysis called a phenome-wide association study, where we looked at correlations between multiple features, MRI, lifestyle features, imaging features, with the prediction of the AI model. And it appears that the AI model is predicting high risk in, in individuals who have greater ventricular volumes, lower cardiac output, more atherosclerotic burden, all of which fits with our thinking. It's also capturing future risk of disease. So the model appears to be capturing future risk of atrial arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation and flutter, AV block, ready arrhythmias, the risk of pacemaker implants, risk of future heart failure and ischemic heart disease, as well as capturing risk of ventricular arrhythmias and the need for implantable uh, cardioverted defibrillators. Finally, in this bit of the, the work, we looked at whether there were any genome-wide association hits and any genomic, genotypic associations with the predictions of the model. And it appears the model tends to predict individuals as being high risk if they have specific abnormalities with the sodium channels, SCN5A and SCN10A, the usual suspects, also CAV1 and RGAP24, this new novel hit that we found on GWAS. So there appears to be some genotypic reasons why someone is predicted as being a high risk individual. So it's all well and good, good predicting high and low risk groups, but when you have an individual patient, I think you need to be able to give that individual a specific risk uh, prediction. So we moved on from looking at broad phenogroups to looking at whether we can give an individual a specific risk prediction. And in this, we adapted the approach by using a supervised uh, machine learning model and instead of trying to predict whether someone is dead or alive, because we all die at some point, is to predict an individual survival curve for a specific individual from an ECG. So we've trained a model using 1.2 million ECGs, where using a single ECG, we can output an individualized survival curve. So you get a prediction of an individual's likelihood of survival or death over 10 years based on a single ECG. And what we get are outputs like this. Uh, these are two individuals, and you can see on the left, there's an individualized survival curve based on a single ECG, and the individual was predicted to die from the black dotted die at around six months, and indeed, they died at around four months on the red dotted line. On the right-hand side, you have an individual who was predicted to die at around four years, and they died just before four years. So the model gets it pretty close, not just whether someone will be dead or alive, but when they might die. Uh, here are two contrasting individuals who survived the 10-year follow-up, and you can see their predicted curves are fairly flat, and they don't actually cross this midline of the 0.5 death line. We can use the track patients over many, many years. Here are two individuals that have had multiple ECGs over 15 years, and each blue dot represents a single ECG and the prediction of death or survival. And you can see for these two individuals, at the start of follow-up, they had very healthy ECGs. They were predicted by the model as being very much likely to survive. And over time, you can see the blue dots drop down the curve. 
And at the end, just before they die, at the red lines, you have predictions of very high risk of mortality. So it's able to track changes over time. And you can see there are, there are bits of the curve where the dips in predictor survival probably reflect the inpatient emission with deterioration and then subsequent improvement. Here are two individuals with multiple CGs that did not die. And you can see, conversely, all the blue dots seem to stay fairly high in the predicted survival probability, never quite drop down towards the zero. And if you take this on the whole population level and take over 100,000 individuals and split into risk quartiles, you can see if the AI model predicts someone to be high risk, they're pretty much almost all dead by 10 to 20 years, whereas a low risk prediction means a very fairly good chance of survival over a 20 year horizon. And the age and sex adjusted hazard ratio is about 8.3 for the high risk group compared to the low risk group. How can we use this and how does it compare to traditional risk markers? If you compare it to the pool core equation, which is traditionally used to predict risk from ASCVD, AI appears to outperform it, outperform that combined with age and sex. But of course, if you combine everything, that improves the performance. Importantly, as I mentioned, even in what physicians in the US deemed as normal ECGs in this US cohort, we're still able to pick up the high-risk individuals from the model that seem to have a 25% mortality rate over the next four years. So it seems to have superhuman abilities that beat years and years of clinical experience. As I explained earlier, it's very important for physicians to understand what the model is looking at and explainability is very important. So we did something called a variational autoencoder that breaks down this gene into different parts so we can see what are the high-risk features. And in this model, you can see on the left-hand side, the left panel of eight uh, leads that a left bundle branch block type morphology is clearly bad, and we relate to that. We see that in the middle panel that T wave changes and T wave abnormalities is bad, and we relate to that. And on the right-hand side, we see SD segment changes and flip T waves again are bad. These are all things that make sense to us. So I want to finish with an example use case. As an electrophysiologist, we're keen to risk stratify patients at risk of ventricular arrhythmias to implant defibrillators. And in 2023, we're pretty much stuck with what we can do. We still go to an echo measurement and LVEF to try and risk stratify individuals. And as you can see, using an LVEF of 35% in this cohort gives us a pretty dismal AURC of 0.6. If you were to try and beat that with AI ECG, just with the first iteration, you can see with an ECG alone, a single ECG, we're able to better pick out individuals that have a higher risk of ventricular tachyarrhythmias over a 10-year horizon with AURC of 0.73. <laughs> so in conclusion, I've hopefully shown you why I've become a lot more passionate about the ECG in the last two or three years. We have developed, developed many models that can identify high-risk phenogroups using unsupervised approach, or more recently, develop very patient-specific actionable mortality prediction models that can be tailored uh, to individual patients. I want to finish by thanking the group who've done all the work, especially Dr. Sal on the top left here. And I want to finish with this editorial that I really like about AICG, which is about trusting magic. Some of the things I've shown you may feel like bit like magic and way beyond human capability. And in this editorial about AICG, they quoted Sir Arthur Clarke, who once surmised that any sufficiently advanced technology must be indistinguishable from magic. And certainly, at this day and age, AICG appears to be like that. But I'm sure we understand that a lot more and make it a lot more explainable. My final quote is this, which I also really like, is that AI will not replace humans, but humans who embrace AI will replace humans who don't. I'll stop there and take some questions and discussion. Thank you, Fu, for that fascinating presentation. Vivek, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, no, I was um I was just gonna ask um if uh Chat GPT came up with that last quote or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great quote, but I'm sure you come up with a better quote. It was something I've stolen from many other it's not my quote, but I've, see, I've seen it in many AI presentations. And I think it's a great line because I, I think it's here to stay. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, the things, this has changed. If you asked me five years ago when I read the Mayo papers about AI predicting future atrial fibrillation from a sinus rhythm ECG with such accuracy, I looked at it and I think many of us thought there's something wrong about it, that this can't be right. 
five years on, I'm fully sold on this. I, I was really mistrusting my fellows when they showed me the data every time, but this really works. And I think AI is here to stay. So we all have to embrace it. And I think not just ECGs, ECGs is the first point because of the volumes we can use to train the models, but intracardiac EGMs or things that we do in the invasive EP lab, we'll be moving towards lots of AI assisted models. Yeah, I mean, I I hundred percent agree with you. I mean, I I think that um, you know it's funny. Uh, years ago, you know, when Mark Josephson would look at an EKG and say, what seemed to me at the time just crazy stuff, like this person is a woman, this person is sick, this person whatever, mm -hmm. and um, I think that uh, you know obviously he was right, and um, I I find it very fascinating though, and I just want to ask you. In your explainability models, I, there was, it was hard for me to see on the screen. Was it that in some patients, some of the pheno groups that you create, that you that the model identified, it was based on looking at the QRS, and some of them were based on the T wave? Is was that what what it was showing? I, yeah. I didn't quite understand. No, so that I think oh, and it's most fundamental in the basis, I think these models are, will never be fully explainable. So I think we always try and grasp at something explainable because we're clinicians. And every time we show our data, the first question is, well, what is it What is it looking at? What is it looking at that I'm not seeing as an expert cardiologist that I've missed for the last 40 years? And why is this model outperforming me? And I think we'll never get to that true explainability because this model is really looking at many, many features in a non-linear combined way. So it's seeing if the T wave is a bit flat and the QRS is more important than the P wave I need to look at more carefully. All of these things that we probably, as clever as we are, can never really fathom. So the explainability is more just to show, just to give a bit of explainability. And what I've shown there is that we break these G down into 20 key features. And we say, which of these features are most important in predicting mortality for the entire group. So we don't look at it on an individual basis. It's very difficult on an individual basis to say, you are at high risk because you have this little squiggly line here and another bump there. And I don't think we'll ever get there. And it's, it's something that the AI field has, I think, grappled with. And there's one view that says we need to be fully explainable for people to embrace it. And the other view is saying, as long as it works, why do we care? If it always works, we don't need to have it explainable. I think as clinicians, we probably prefer the first view, which is we need to understand what it's doing. Well, I, I didn't think that you need to understand that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rahul. Well, I mean, it's just sort of to piggyback on that sort of idea, because, I mean, you could see this sort of creating a huge paradigm shift. I mean, all of us are clinical trialists. Uh, and so you could absolutely say, like you did in your sudden death prediction, you're already choosing a cohort that theoretically might be at higher risk, and you're potentially enriching that population. And so, okay, maybe, maybe you use it initially to enrich your population, increase your event rates, and demonstrate a greater benefit in a patient population that you already sort of are targeting. But as clinical trialists, I mean, if you did an ECG on me and said that I was going to die in six months, I'd say, okay, you know, Vivek put an ICD in me or something, right? But what data, or what are what are the payers? What is CMS? What is um, what are these folks going to require? Historically, we have this hypothesis, but then you need prospective data validating, and I can't imagine that it's going to be very easy to do an ECG and then do a randomized trial with an ICD implant or even anticoagulation for AFib, right? I mean, I, I fully agree. I mean, we're sort of sorry. Tell me that. <laughs> With that point, well, I don't know if you made the point yet, but I, I believe very strongly that it does need randomized trials. I think without randomized trials, we're making way too many assumptions. And so you need to show outcome uh, improvements, not just that you have a marker of death, even if the marker is perfect. I mean, nothing says that there. this is necessarily going to be responsive to ICDs, for example, right? Um, just as, for example, predicting AFib in a patient six years from now or whatever, that doesn't necessarily mean that patient's going to be responsive to anticoagulation to prevent stroke. It might be, but it may not yep. be. And uh, the timing, the and, NNT, all of that is going to be critical to understand. Yeah, and I fully agree with you both. There's something we've been sort of thinking about testing prospectively the models. 
And I agree with you, just because you know someone will die in a year doesn't mean you can in any way affect that path. So it's probably no point telling someone they will die in a year if you can't change it for them. And that's where it absolutely needs the prospective study. And I agree with you, it's very difficult to, to run, very difficult to prove with a very long time horizon to show any benefit. Of course, you can use it in a, a setting where there is high mortality, so in an inpatient cohort and use it as a sort of risk warning thing. But you could also use it on the other end of the spectrum to reassure. So we in the UK are struggling with a very big workload and, and, and with the NHS, and we're thinking about whether we can use the low risk prediction to reassure general practitioners and to reduce the workload in, in our clinic. And that may be easy to prove, but I take your point, none of this will ever be adopted without well-conducted randomized prospective studies to show that not only is it accurate, but there's something that we can do to alter the tra trajectory of the patients. Hence, our efforts to look at the explainability, explainability aspects. We're trying to find out what should we do? What is it that will happen to this patient? And what should we, because mortality is so broad, what will they die from? And can we do something to affect that pathway? But I think that will be very difficult to prove, um, but we're gonna try. You know, I just want to make a comment about the um, about the explainability uh, stuff because I, I do appreciate your point that look, if it works, then you need to understand all of it. I, I get that. Having said that, I think that the explainability is going to be important um, for many of us clinicians to accept that there really is something there. I mean, you need something to at least gain confidence that yes, this is really, that there's something real going on. And I, I think that that is important. I, I'll tell you, so recently we published a manuscript, um, Josh Lampert from our group um, was the one who really did all the work where we looked at patients who um, who had PVCs and developed myopathy versus PVCs and not developed myopathy. And um, yes, with, with a lot of EKGs, you can predict who's gonna develop myopathy and who's not. But what was really interesting for me was that when we did the explainability um, analyses, what was what the what lit up was not the PVCs, <laughs> which I was surprised. That's what I would have expected. But what do I know? It turns out there was actually the sinus beat that was actually predicting which patients had that sensitivity to develop myopathy versus not. Um, does that tell me that much more about physiology? I don't know, but it certainly when I saw that and I put it in the context of everything else that we learn about. ECG, uh, AI ECG, sort of um, uh, all these manuscripts that are coming out, it does give me more confidence. So the next time I see a uh, a, 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 um, a machine learning algorithm that predicts something, I, I'm just a little bit less skeptical. So I do think the explainability stuff does matter. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that was a very nice paper. I was also you know, a little bit surprised to see it wasn't, wasn't the PVC, but but the sinus rhythm, rhythm beat. No, you might spin another way and say, well, SGLT2 inhibitors work beautifully. They reduce risk. Well, we're all prescribing them. We have no idea what the mechanism is, but we're very happy to prescribe it. So we seem to hold AI to a higher bar than some drugs that work that we don't understand how they work. Um, so potentially there might be a sort of, I think with time, there might be more acceptance that these things do what they do. It's the sort of black box nature that, as they come through when they're new, people are very skeptical, and rightly so. I think it's also the ease of it. I mean, it's too easy <laughs> to, to suddenly apply an ECG algorithm. I think you want to and have it go through just, the filter. Something hard. And it seems too good to be true. It just seems too good to be true. I'll be honest, I've not put my own KG through that model yet. I think none of my team have yet to put our own ECGs through that. <laughs> At some point, we'll have the guts to put it through the, through the algorithm, but we haven't yet. <laughs> I also but want to just echo uh, your point. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ralph. No, no. Go ahead, Vivek. Well, I was just going to underscore the point that you that you made about um, you know potentially using these to let's say identify the low risk patients that you don't have to worry about. So similarly, like one of the things we're interested in, I'm, I'm still not sure how we do the study, but we're interested in, for example, if we can identify. Let's just take a talk to, about the PVCs, for example. If you identify the patients where, okay, they're not going to develop myopathy, even though they have a high PVC burden, well, those are patients that we don't need to torture with, you know, with being worried about yeah. developing myopathy. They don't necessarily need an ablation. Conversely, there may be patients with 
a three or five percent burden who will develop a myopathy and they're ones we either need to intervene with drugs or ablation or at least minimally follow very carefully so i think um there are good reasons to think and this, again this is one example i think there's lots of other examples that people can can imagine yeah and i think i totally agree with that i think that's one really good use and other uses include in the cardiomyopathy clinic so gene positive phenotype negative we're bringing them out every year for an echo an ecg and they never manifest any disease. Do Can we spread it out? Can we see them once every five years if they're low risk? There are all these possibilities that go beyond just finding the right patients for an ICD that we're just beginning to think about, I think. I'll tell you what, I absolutely appreciate your opening comments of how it's made you just sort of re-fall in love with the ECG. I mean, I think our generation went into electrophysiology because of the ECG and, and you know, I mean, I'm so Vivek, I loved your papers group, uh, your group's paper, and it's a, yet another example. We're doing more and more interventions in electrophysiology where it's more important to map in sinus as compared to mapping whatever else we're doing. Uh, just the beauty of the of the cardiac uh, electrical conduction system, right? And it's uh, has so many applications as we're learning more and more about. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. Yeah, I, I do think um, your um, your quote at the end is very important. We as clinicians have to get with the program and start understanding AI and don't view it as something in the mythical future. It's around the corner, um, so I, we need to understand it and see how it how it could be used in our practice. But I think the first bit of that quote is also very important. I don't think it'll ever replace us. I think it still needs physicians to use it. Just like when you write code, you don't need to be an expert. Now, ChatGPT will write it for you, but you still need to know what you're doing to interpret what ChatGPT is outputting. So similarly, with these models, I don't think it will ever replace us. I think it will be very, very useful tools for physicians going forward. So how many know, of you have you seen that? Maybe the creator. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, if you take AI and robotics, then I think a lot of what we do may be replaced. Someone <laughs> still has to get vascular access, though, so we still have that for it. Well, I think I, I, I'm going to have to break up this panel. I mean, I have to say, number one, Phil, I think you, I mean, this is an incredibly fascinating presentation. You could not get our panelists to stop talking. This is the best chairing. I started and I'm ending the session. So thank you, Vivek and Raul, for, for your insights and being great panelists today. Um, and thank you, Fu, for that, again, for that fascinating presentation and, and bringing more about magic into our world, is how I'd say, and getting us in, falling in love with EKGs again. So thank you again. And uh, before we wrap uh, day two, let's take a moment to reflect on uh, another fantastic day.